welcome to our services today. And I want you to know that it is a joy to have you with us, no matter where you happen to be joining us from. And as we begin our service today, as we always do with these songs, I want you to also know that however you approach these, whether it's singing out loud in your, your living room or wherever you happen to be watching, or if you're just quietly taking these words into your heart, know that that is an act of worship, that you are either singing or listening to the words that speak of the truth of who God is, uh, what he has to offer us, and the things that we most truly need to be grateful for. So we ask that you join us today, and let's sing and offer these as the redeemed of God. song that we're going to do today is a song called I Am. And over the years, so many people have told me how much they love this song and how uh, important it has been to them at certain times in their lives. But the song also points to something else that we can find in worship songs. We're often, we'll sing words, but not necessarily pause to think exactly what it is that we're saying. And because the truth is, is this song really reveals an incredible uh, amount of vulnerability and intimacy. Because it's not very often that we're willing to go to people and tell them that we need them to the point that we would actually say, I need to hold on to you. And so to be able to go to God and sing these words, I am holding on to you, really reveals uh, an intimacy and a vulnerability and a request from God where there's a trust and a hope that only he would be able to fulfill that. You know, over this, uh, this coming year, as we go through a year with Jesus, uh, really one of the great hopes is that you might grow in intimacy with God and in prayer. 
and that spending time with him every single week looking at the stories of Jesus might help to develop that, that intimacy with him. And so as you approach God with this song and singing I Am, my hope is that you would pause, take a moment, and think about what it really means to hold on to God and to acknowledge that need that you have for him. And maybe even as you sing it or just hear these words, that you would conjure that image in your mind of you holding on to Jesus, the one who welcomes that and invites you to do that in his presence. Let's sing this together. There's no space that is love. So as we get this morning started, we want to kick off with our tithes and offerings. So just allow me to pray for that real quick, and we will get started. Father God, thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to give as you've given us so much. I pray that this offering blesses you and encourages the church to continue on fighting for your name and continue on serving the people that you love so dearly. I pray that this, this time... And this word encourages people to continue to seek your face, seek your kindness, and seek your love throughout their entire lives. In your name I pray. Amen. As you give, you can see how you can give below. 
And as that time comes to a close, what I would like to do is lead us in a time of communion. Uh, a time to reflect on the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And to allow that to refresh us and be a deep breath, a time of remembrance of who he is and what he did for us. So as we go into that, let's just take a moment to do that in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. And once we're finished, Pastor Joe will be here to give us the message. Thank you. Well, last week we talked about how our decisions matter. Even the little decisions matter. So when we make a decision, we stop and ask ourselves, okay, where is this taking me? Where is this leading me? Because ultimately our lives are the sum of our decisions. Our decisions have a way of deciding our lives for us. And so we don't just say, hey, what do I wanna do right now in the moment? Because sometimes what we want in the moment doesn't necessarily lead to who we want to be later. So we ask some significant questions. You know, who do I want to become? Who do I want to be later? And there are times in our lives where we end up making decisions that don't really match up with what you want to do or what you want to do later and what you're going to do right then in the moment. I talked about that last week. It's the law of sowing and reaping. That you reap what you sow, that every decision that you make is a seed that you sow in the ground and you always reap what you sow. And we understand this, the, the ripple effect of small decisions, but ultimately our lives and our big decisions are determined by the smaller decisions. And so what we wanna do is learn to use every single day and every single decision as opportunities to become who God has called us to be to allow him to do his work in us and through us one decision at a time. Well, Jesus is going to talk to us about another thing today. You know, you want to have an impact. You want to do something in your life that's significant. It happens one decision at a time, one day at a time. And what we're going to talk about this morning, what Jesus talks about is it happens one dollar at a time. Now, Interestingly enough, Jesus talked more about money than he talked about prayer, than he talked about heaven, than he talked about faith. And why would that be? 
Because Jesus understands that our money, more than anything else in life, has a way of accurately gauging our hearts. He put it like this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so if you want to know what's important to a person, well, you look at where they put their money. If you want to align your heart with what's important to God, then you put your money there and you watch because you know what happens? Your heart will follow. So Jesus, he talked a lot about that kind of thing. Now, he never, he never took up an offering. He didn't own a home. He was homeless, but he still talked about money an awful lot. Now, why is that? Well, here's another reason. He knows that money is God's chief competition. You know, historically, people look to money to do for them what God wants to do for them. You know, money is going to be our source of significance. Money is going to be the place where we find security. And so if, if we're not careful, we can put our hope in money and what money can do for us. And then, you know, what ends up happening is that God doesn't actually seem necessary. That's why Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. God, Lord, give us today our daily bread. So we don't reach a place where we forget our dependence on him. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 6, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. He didn't say, well, you shouldn't serve. He doesn't say, you may not serve. He says, you can't. You, you actually can't do it. Even if you want to try, it won't work. And then he goes on, you'll either love one and hate the other, you'll hate one and love the other. And so, Jesus talks about money. Now, we're going to look here at, in, in a passage in Luke chapter 21. And uh, it's only four verses, and it's not a sermon that uh, Jesus preaches. Instead, what he's going to do is he's going to get our attention and draw us to look at this woman who is a poor widow. And this poor widow, we don't even know her name, has taught us to look at money and finances in a completely different way. And I think for many of us, that's what we need. You know, I, I know this is an area that when we start talking about money or finances, it kind of makes us nervous and we have very definitive views on how we think and, and how we understand and what this means in our life. But I think sometimes we need things turned upside down for us. And, and that's what Jesus does, man. He is such an expert at turning things upside down. And, and that's what happens when we look at money from his perspective. It, it'll feel different. It'll feel upside down from what the world teaches us. And, and, and how we've been taught to think. How we practice the discipline of managing our finances. This looks so different. Well, let's pick it up in verse 1 of Luke 21. Jesus looked up. He saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, he said to his disciples, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All of these, these other people, gave the gifts out of the abundance of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So he's standing outside the temple with his disciples, Jesus was, and there's these, there's these three large bronze receptacles where, where people would come in and, they, and they'd put their offerings in them. And it was really a big ordeal, okay? Because in those days, there's no paper currency, and so coins would be put into these receptacles. And it would make a, a ton of noise. I mean, they're, 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 they're metal on metal, and it would just clang. It would make a ton of noise. And you could tell who the big givers were by how much, noise, how much noise they made when they gave. And so people would make a show of this. You know, they'd bring as many coins as possible. Mark says in his gospel, they threw them in. You know, it's like they wanted it to sound loud. And so then you could tell who the big givers were, or the rich people were, by the noise that they made. And I know that people would stand to the side and they would just try to decide who was going to really bring the noise and kind of judge people's worth by the value of looking at them and decide if they were going to be the people who brought the noise, you know, brought the big gifts. 
But here's what we see in this story. Heaven hears things differently than we do. The noise that gets heaven's attention is different than the noise that I think oftentimes gets our attention. So this woman, she comes on the scene, nobody notices. They don't pay attention to her. She's obviously poor. She's got two tiny little coins. She puts them in. She's completely overlooked. And when she drops those coins, here's what happens. It is so loud in heaven that all of heaven turns and looks because heaven hears things differently than we do. And Jesus talks about this woman who puts these two coins in verse 3. Says this put, he said, this poor widow put in more than all the others. Put in more than all the others. Now, we've got to look at that because we're going to see in a second here that these, these coins were not more. Okay, They're just not. If you think about it, the, this word more is, is, a, is a word that kind of should be a hang-up for us because... She didn't put in more. She just didn't. They were two tiny coins, and others are putting in much more than that. At least, not how we understand more. Because the way that we understand more is what? More. More is more, less is less. And we look at our word, world, and, and, and that's just math for us. So if I asked you right now, is 10 more than 9? You would say, of course it is. It's not your opinion. It just is. Ten is more than nine. How often is it more than nine? You'd have to say all the time. That's how often. More is always more. Except apparently when it's not. I mean, $100 is more than $10, isn't it? Jesus uses this word more in such a way that it ought to get our attention here. So what this woman does, she gives these two copper coins, and they would be called a mite. And the way for you to think of a mite in our economy, just to help us understand a little bit, is that it was one one hundred and sixty fourth of an average day's wage. An average day's wage back then was a denarius. A mite was one hundred sixty fourth of a denarius. Okay, so let's just put it in terms we might understand. If you make $15 an hour and you work eight hours a day, you would make $120 a day. 164th of $120 would be about 73 cents. That's what she has here. 73 cents. That's all she has. And she puts it in. And this is what gets the attention of Jesus. From our perspective, it wouldn't seem to make any difference, okay? Not really. But, but Jesus says, I mean, 73 cents doesn't make that big a difference to us. But Jesus says, she's the one who's put in more than all the others. Gospel Mark makes it even more, uh, puts it more strongly. Put in more than all the others combined. So this woman here, Luke 21, she gives two coins. And it's easy for us to look at that and say, okay, well, that's not that much. In fact, I mean, if I were there, honestly, and, and I knew this woman and she was coming and she's going to throw those two coins in, I mean, I, I would almost expect to hear Jesus say, hey, hey, you, you don't need to do that. Why don't you just hang on to that? It's, you keep that. You can, you can buy some food later on today to eat. I might have done that, but that's not what Jesus does. Why? Here's why. Because Jesus knows that his Father, our Father in heaven, is going to take care of her. And he knows her reward in heaven. And he's not going to rob her of her reward in heaven. And so, instead, he points our eyes to her, okay? And honestly, if we really think about it, arguably, there is no one probably who's ever served as a greater inspiration for generosity more than this poor widow who gave two coins. God has used her incredible ways. So, the, the way that Jesus looks at more is, is different than how we look at more. Okay? In the book of Psalms, it says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 
Now think about that for a second. Because he owns everything, if the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, if he already owns everything, for Jesus there's no such thing as more. Because if you already have everything, then more is not even a concept, at least of how we see more. It's not a concept you need to worry about. If you have everything, it's impossible to actually have more because everything is already yours. So when Jesus uses the word more, he's defining it in a different way. Jesus defined more as not by the portion, but by the proportion. Not by the portion, but by the proportion. This is significant. Because this woman gives more not because of the amount of the number, or that her number was greater uh, than, than the other people's numbers. No, it was because of the proportion of what she had. This represented everything she had. You know, for Jesus, if you have everything, there's very little difference between a million and, and a mite. A million dollars and a mite. If you own everything, <laughs> those things don't mean anything. But proportionately, there's a difference here. And this is what moves the heart of God in such a significant way. It's not portion, it's proportion. Another way we could say this is Jesus defines the word more, not by the sum, but by the sacrifice. And so, you know, we, 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 we think about what King David said, we join with him, we say, I'm not going to offer the Lord anything that costs me nothing. I want it to cost something. How else can I express my appreciation and gratitude and my commitment to God if it doesn't cost me anything, if I'm not sacrificing anything? Another way of thinking of this is not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. And I, and I think that that's what God blesses. That's what gets the attention of Jesus. Not the sum, it's the sacrifice. You know, so if we look at it through this lens, then that makes how we define who's a big giver quite differently. You know, what if, what if the biggest giver, for example, in this church is not somebody who's wealthy who gives $1,000 a week? What if, it's a, what if it's a single mom who gives $10 a week? Because what God can do, and everything is His, so what God can do when a single mom gives $10 a week because she's struggling and this is everything she can give, that's completely up to Him. He has the power. And so, that's what he does. That's why we don't try to measure it that way. Jesus talks about this a little bit in Matthew 6. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've already received their reward in full. And that's true. Here's what he says instead. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left, left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you. So what Jesus is warning us here is saying, listen, if you give, if you're giving things away in order to be noticed and, and you get your attention and everybody sees your name on it, that's fine. Understand this though, that's your reward. That's what you give for it. And I think sometimes we fall into this trap because we want to give in a way that makes us feel good about ourselves, kind of lets us be the hero in the moment, you know, kind of, Gives, gives ourselves a pat on the back. Um, but, but, you know, when we give, we, 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 we just give. We give it out of, the, out of our heart, and we, we do it, and it keeps our ego out of it. That's why, you know, here at CCTO, you give, and you do it anonymously. It keeps your ego out of it. We're not going to put a name on the building because of what you gave. You don't get a better parking spot. Jesus said, listen, your reward is in heaven. Another thing as you look at sacrifice in scripture is, is it's portrayed is like this. It's the idea of sacrificing something now for what you receive later. And this is consistently how it's referred to in scripture. It's not uh, that I'm going to get a reward now. I'm going to get something later. And it's like an opportunity of what God wants to give us in heaven. We give not out of obligation, but because of opportunity. I would never, ever ask you to give out of obligation. Listen, this is an opportunity for us to bless others and to know that someday we will receive a reward from the Father. 
So Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. He talks about what we sacrifice uh, of the kingdom in, in this. He says, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in heaven and will inherit eternal life. A hundred times as much? I mean, that's an opportunity, isn't it? That's incredible. That's like 10,000% rate of return. That's pretty good. It means like a dollar here is worth $100 there. A $1,000 here is $100,000 there. Now, obviously, okay, heaven doesn't use U.S. currency. But, but Jesus is using language here, and he's doing it in such a way he's exaggerating, okay? He's using hyperbole here to make a point, all right? He's trying to use language that we can understand, and he's trying to say, listen, it is more than you could even imagine. So when we give, it's not an obligation, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to humbly join in with the work that God wants us to do and wants to accomplish in this world. So that's my encouragement to you. And that's our commitment as a church family is one day at a time, one decision at a time, yes, one dollar at a time, to reach one person at a time, to make disciples one at a time with the good news of the gospel. Father, thank you for your grace that meets us here right in this moment. Father, I, I just pray that you would help us to look at things through your eyes, through your lens. Would you give us the wisdom to do that, to become the stewards of the things that you have given us that you call us to be, Father? Would you, would you allow us to give in a way that costs us something, that it's sacrificial? Lord, you, you made the greatest sacrifice ever, the, the greatest gift ever the most sacrificial gift ever when you sent your son Jesus for us. We thank you for that. May it be our privilege, Lord, and our opportunity to join you in the work of pointing as many people to Jesus as possible. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
May you go in the goodness of God this week. God bless you and we'll see you again next Sunday.